Lisa Zook. I'm the Vice President of Strategic Initiatives here at Chicago Theological Seminary, um, and I'm delighted to welcome you to our weekly time of Wednesday gathering. Um, as folks are getting on and our numbers are growing, just a reminder, um, you come into the meeting already muted, and if you can leave yourself on mute, um, that's really helpful so we don't have a lot of background noise that we will be able to hear from our featured speakers and our panelists and guests. Um, there will be opportunities um, toward the end to perhaps ask some questions. So if you are asking a question, be sure to unmute yourself. Um, and we also encourage everyone to open up your chat window, click on that little speech, bu speech bubble on the bottom of your screen. A chat window will appear. Um, you can leave a comment um, in real time as our, as, our, as our speakers are talking, if you have a question or comment. Um, you can also send direct messages to people that you see on here by way of saying, hi, hello, greetings, nice to see your face. Um, so definitely use that. Um, and um, uh, I'm just really, really excited to have you here. We start all of our Wednesday gatherings um, with words of gathering, um, bringing ourselves into the space. And today I'm excited to welcome Bumika Bhatia, a CTS student and a friend of mine, um, to invite us in. So Bumika, I'll turn it to you now. Um, okay. Thank you, Lisa. I am very happy to be here. Um, I am Bumika Bhatia. I'm a student at CTS. I am from India. I was born and brought up in India and I've been with CTS since 2015. I'm walking the pace of a tortoise one day, someday. I'll be out of here for good. <laughs> um, so today the prayers that I will be singing are the prayers um, or obeisances uh, that I'll be paying to all the spiritual masters through whom I have received whatever knowledge and wisdom in my path of spirituality that I have received. Um, I also invite everybody to have that meditation while I sing. Uh, the words may not make sense. Uh, it's in Sanskrit. Um, but I invite you all to think of all the spiritual masters, all the personal persons who've, who've participated or who's contributed in your spiritual journey. Um, so here. Om Jnana Timirandasya. Gyananjana Shalakaya Chakshurun Militam Yena Tasmai Shri Guru Venamaha Jai Shri Chaitanya Mano Bhishtam Stapitam Yena Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Vandeham Shri Guru Shri Yutapada Kamalam Shri Guru Vaishnavamscha Shri Rupam Sagrajatam Sahagana Ragunathan Vitam Tam Sajivam Sadvaitam Savadhutam Parijana Sahitam Krishna Chaitanya Devam Shri Radha Krishna Padan Sahagana Lalita Shri Vishakhan Vitamscha Namahum Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Swayam Rupa Kadamayam Dadati Swapadantikam Namahum Brahmanaya Namo Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prishtaya Bhutale Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swaminiti Namine Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Shunnevadi Pashadesa Tarine Namo Mahavadanyaya Krishna Prema Pradayati Krishnaya Krishna Chaitanya Namne Gorat Vishe Namaha Namo Brahmana Devaya Gau Brahmana Hitayacha Jagatitaya Krishnaya Govindaya Namo Namaha Jai Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Shri Advaita Gadadhara Shri Vasadi Gaurabhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 
रामा रामा हरे हरे थैंक यू you muted lisa but i clicked that sorry um thank you bumaka that was beautiful and i appreciated the opportunity to reflect and meditate on people who have contributed to my own spiritual journey and bumaka that includes you um so uh that was that was wonderful um, friends, I am so excited uh, to get us into our conversation and to welcome our guests today. Um, we are going to be talking about uh, part-time ministry, and we have with us to lead us in that conversation, Reverend Dr. Lily, Lillian Daniel. Uh, Lillian is a longtime friend of CTS. She's been an adjunct professor with us. Um, she is a trustee, um, and she's also the senior minister at First Congregational Church in Dubuque, Iowa. And she'll be joined in conversation with Reverend Jeffrey McDonald, um, who recently published a book called Part-Time is Plenty, Thriving Without Full-Time Clergy. So in just a moment, the two of them will be in dialogue together. And then um, they're also going to be joined later with three panelists, um, three alums of CTS, uh, three friends of mine who I studied with when I was a student at CTS, uh, Reverend Jamie Hawley, Reverend Robin Gray, and Reverend, Reverend Kim Vasco. So delighted to have all of you with us today. Um, and before I turn it to Lillian and Jeff, um, they asked, uh, uh, asked me to ask some questions of you, our gathered audience. So we're going to do show of hands, and you can either just raise your actual hand up, or if you want to get really fancy, there's a reaction button, and you can raise your hand with a reaction. But they're curious to know a little bit about who's in the room. So my first question is, if you are an alum of CTS, raise your hand. Did you study at CTS? I did. Yeah. Um, Awesome. Awesome. Um, are you a student at CTS? Uh, how many current students do we have here with us? And there's also some current students probably with Amy Ashleman. She gathers, yep, she, she's got some students with her. They gather in person. Um, so there's a group of students in CTS room 118, as well as those who are raising their hand. Um, and how many of you are currently serving in ministry positions, generally speaking? Awesome. And how many of you are serving in part-time roles? Great. Great. Well, hopefully that, um, Lillian and, uh, and Jeffrey, hopefully that helps to give you a sense of who is in the room. Um, and I will turn it to you, Lillian, to get us started. Thank you so much. So I've been... Um, I have been really excited to um, bring the, to the CTS community the work of Jeff McDonald because when I got a chance to read his book on part-time ministry, it was one of the first books that I had read about that subject that was not the usual hand-wringing about the state of the church or the decline of the church or what's difficult about this. What I loved was that um, Jeff had actually a very hopeful vision and even the radical idea that um, part-time ministry may actually save the church and bring blessings that we didn't expect. So I want to um, introduce him to you and let him say just a little bit about his book, Part-Time is Enough. Great, thank you very much, Lillian. Yeah, it's great to be with all of you today. I'm delighted to have this time and uh, to, to be a contributor as well as a learner among all of you. I'm looking forward to the panel and all the conversation that we'll have. Um, I have written this book because I was basically in a situation where I needed it. I wished I could find this book on the shelf and it didn't exist. So I went about learning how I could get the information under my belt and then share it. And so I was a, a part-time pastor uh, coming into a church that had a full-time position prior to me. And then I came in as a 10 hour a week pastor. Um, the church pivoted in a big way, cut its uh, salaries, its staffing uh, in order to survive financially. And 
I needed to figure out with them, uh, how do we do it? And how do you do it effectively? How do churches thrive? And I knew that not all churches do when they go part-time, but some do. I had heard anecdotally that some do. And so I got a grant to go uh, learn from those who have who, who are doing better after going to part-time ministry uh, there uh, by various measurements on vitality scales of, of attendance, of mission impact, of engagement of parishioners uh, who, are, who are actively involved in church life, as well as financial stability. So I'm just excited to get to, to share some of what I found, some of the patterns and trends that I saw uh, and and field questions from Lillian and from others um, in terms of uh, why does this sometimes work uh, in a way that is, as Lillian says, uh, adding vitality to uh, a, a church's life and um, and 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 really being a, a gift rather than a burden. Your book is full of um, all sorts of different stories of creative ways of doing part-time ministry well. The bourbon. So I commend the book to people for that, for sure. Um, but your side hustle, Jeff, is um, that you're a journalist and a writer. And, um, you know, a lot of times we think of what, what are the other jobs that pastors might do, counselor, teacher. But in your research, you found that there was a lot more variety in the job combinations. What did you find? Yeah, I did. I, I found all kinds of examples, some of which made it into the book and others uh, didn't uh, work them in. There the, would have been too many to list, but, uh, you know, I, I talked with a, a pastor who had, who was a bartender uh, outside of his work. Uh, and it was, it was by his choice. He, he wanted to uh, add that to his repertoire and, and he, it was just a, a great compliment to his life. It was different and it was uh, supporting it, it fed his soul to listen to people's stories at the bar, um, and uh, and and use a different side of his brain, if you will. Um, I, I've talked to people who are uh, electricians uh, and uh, also serve the church, uh, as well as uh, people who are in, um, in 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 other fields, like you might expect. Some who are in in uh, uh, social work or something, but 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 also a financial advisor is one of my uh, good examples in the book. Um, so yeah, it comes from all all different areas, and I think that's part of what makes this rich and interesting and exciting. So, a lot of times I've heard the expression "there's no such thing as part-time ministry," and I think we all know what that means. That you can have a job that says you work 15 or 20 hours a week. But that time creep and the the pastoral needs, you know, never go away. Um, how do you see pastors successfully negotiating that and having a having a life with these kind of jobs? Yeah, it's a great question, Lillian. And, and uh, it came up at at a church uh, in Southbridge, Massachusetts, that I visited, where they had gone part time and it didn't work, uh, and it really they they struggled so much with it that the pastor was not getting the time uh, that she needed uh, outside the church and the congregation was um, not uh, getting what it needed from the pastor. And so it just was floundering. And when they put it back together, it did work. And so the question was, uh, you know, the, after they went back to full time and then returned to part time again, the next time it worked much better. So what was the difference? And the answer was that they talked about how the division of ministry would be shared. And they delineated in the contract what the congregation would do, as well as what the pastor would do in the areas of ministry. Uh, whereas often a, a ministry, a, a pastor's contract will describe what the pastor is responsible for, and it won't say much of anything about what the congregation is responsible for in terms of, especially in terms of ministry, but also in terms of administration and uh, other areas of responsibility. So um, that Wait, was I just one. I want to stop and have you repeat yeah. that. That's fascinating. So a, a contract with a part-time pastor that also outlines the responsibilities of the congregation. 
Yes, yes. So you think of it as a as a covenant that is between two parties uh, and with God, and it's a it's a where they say this is what we understand our mutual uh, agreement and commitment to be. So this is how we're going to work together. Um, it's really more. It, it really is. This is part of what I love about this area is I keep discovering ways that you say, well, you know, that's kind of what it should have been all along uh, is is not so much an employment contract, but a description of how these folks are going to work together to live out the sense of calling that that we've all acknowledged that we have. They feel called to work with you and you feel called to work with them. So why shouldn't it be a mutual description uh, that 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 allows for clearer expectations and, uh, and and it's not just sort of a sense of let's get a pastor let's pay him or her as much as we can and just hope that they do all the things that we expect and and we'll somehow find time for it um, let's just hope that they can pull a few tricks out of their back pocket and make this work you know that's that's not sustainable it leads to frustration it leads to burnout and we can do better and the churches that thrive are doing better what are some examples of things that the congregation might take on or remove from the pastor's job description in a healthy part-time situation sure and and this is, I've seen different examples, uh, so it's very locally specific. Uh, not every church will do it the same way, uh, but in in some congregations, you'll see some of the visitation be done uh, and some of the pastoral care be done by the deacons or a pastoral care team uh, who will keep tabs on folks, uh, make visits, call people, um include them in in prayer groups and uh and so so that can be a, a ministry of presence that's that's entirely doable there there's also uh in in bible studies or adult education uh spiritual formation groups uh sometimes you'll have people in the congregation who have enough leadership abilities or organizational skills and knowledge of of the scriptures to to lead that very effectively, uh, and sometimes you have people who are willing, but they need a little boost or they need a little guidance, and so the pastor may have a role of meeting with a, a, a couple of small group leaders um, who will carry the Bible study ministry into the small group setting, but have that meeting once a month with the leaders who then go do it rather than leading it on her own or his own for the uh for for, for the uh you know every single week with one or more groups so so it's uh it's it's sharing ministries like that and then there's there's many others uh evangelism doesn't have to all be on the shoulders of the pastor uh what uh, that's right uh, you heard it here lillian uh the uh <laughs> It's, you know, it's, it's, uh, and, and I, I talked with a church in, in Gloucester, Massachusetts, where it, that had been the expectation was that kind of reaching out to people, inviting them to church, talking with them about spirituality, uh, was on the shoulders of the pastor. And, uh, and that was just how they did it. The people were reticent New Englanders and they didn't want to talk to anybody about coming to church. If they, if they want to be here, they know where to find us. You know, that's, that's the, that's the New England style, right? We've been in the same location for 350 years. I think they know where to find us. And, um, and, and, uh, uh, and this, and this uh, was an Episcopal priest who uh, led them through a, a joyful 12 week program. I think it was, uh, to 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 learn to be evangelists they uh, he he brought an irenic uh text on the subject that the people read and discussed and now he's got a cohort of people in his congregation who are comfortable in a new england way uh where i'm located uh, to talk about it um 
that's authentic. And basically it's largely about how do you tell people what your faith means to you and what following being a follower of Jesus, what that means to your life. Um, you know, it's largely in the first person and it, but it makes a difference. And uh, so that's another way that now he isn't carrying all the outreach responsibility. I mean, so I have to tell my favorite New England uh, church member joke, because I used to pastor in New England, but how many um, New England Congregationalists does it take to change a light bulb? And the answer is three, one to change the light bulb and two to say, what was wrong with the old one? <laughs> so it points to that reluctance to change in churches. And I think a lot of times you have to be forced to change in order to discover the ministries and the talents and the callings within the congregation. I think of the last you know, year and a half of COVID and while we missed having a choir so much, we discovered all kinds of people who could play musical instruments that we didn't know about because we, we hadn't had that lack. Um, I wanna segue a little bit into COVID and then into our panel as well. So um, let me begin by introducing our panelists and each um, three of these uh, CTS alumni to see um, Robert in my classes, who is currently full-time at First Congregational in Washington, Connecticut, which may be one of the most beautiful spots um, on earth. It's a gorgeous little place in uh, Litchfield. And um, Robin was formerly part-time in Grand Rapids and Berwyn. Jamie Hawley um, is part-time at Lincoln Memorial Congregational UCC in Chicago, which is the oldest Black United Church of Christ in Illinois. Um, he was also my seminary intern when he was a student at Chicago Theological Seminary. Not only is he part-time pastor now, but also full-time college counselor, part-time diversity instructor at Harvard. And then uh, Kim Vasco is at St. John's UCC in Lyons, Illinois, is part-time there and is also part-time working for the Illinois Conference, but has also had the experience during COVID of working for the national setting of the church. So let me um, move into the subject of COVID because we know that COVID has transformed everything. And there are a lot of churches that are um, maybe previously full-time and we're seeing um, the great resignation is definitely affecting clergy. A lot of people are retiring early or moving on. And we're also gonna see probably a fair number of churches that are gonna make that transition from full-time to um, part-time. But along with in COVID, we've also experienced um, really having to be forced to learn technology and realize that there are things we can do um, that we didn't know we could do. And Kim, why don't you kick us off with some reflections on yeah, how COVID-19 affected you and technology um, in your various positions? Sure. Um... You talk about the idea of some churches being forced to change. <laughs> um, COVID, I think, uh, definitely did that. At least it did that for for my small little local church in Lyons. Um, you know, they over the years they had tried to do things and maybe um, maybe recorded a service or such, but um, wasn't really willing to engage it until we had to and. Fortunately, I had somebody on board um, in leadership who understood the technology. And so when COVID happened, um, he was able to set everything up through the computer. So I created a space in my home, which you can kind of see, I have a green screen that I mounted on the ceiling, right? So I'd pull the green screen down and he would, I would create the same um, outline for worship that I would every week and send it to him in advance. And then I would record the different components and he'd weave it all together and put it out there. Um, so we were able to, um, to, to really quickly turn and use technology um, to at least be out there for the people in our community. Now, the other thing that I think was really important in, with the technology is I have a congregation like many of us that is in decline. There are a lot of elderly folk. And so they were really intimidated by the idea of Zoom and even Facebook or any of that. Um, and what we would do is we had different groups of people that would call out to people 
you know, so it was taking leadership of different individuals in the congregation. So I couldn't be all and do all for everyone, right? Um, and talk some of these folks through the different challenges while they're trying to set up a Zoom account. And I had one 85 year old who never dreamed that she'd be able to do Zoom that started doing our book club. And she was so excited. And just having that one person who was probably the most challenged for a variety of reasons actually be successful doing it kind of got the ball rolling for everyone, right? And do um, and have some of you found that um, the, the use of technology has almost provided um, different ways that you can you can be present in pastoral ministry in more than one place? And how has that worked for you? I want to add to what I just said only because I'm in a situation right now. I'm in quarantine right now because my son tested positive this week and I have an adult son that lives in the house with me. So I can't go to church this week and preach. And we've been, you know, gathering safely in our small community. Um, so what we're going to do this Sunday is an experiment. <laughs> I'm going to pre-record my sermon, um, but people are going to gather at the church and we're going to try to do it live. And then I've got the backup of, of having recorded it so that they can project my sermon with me preaching to them if that doesn't work. So again, technology is, is a really a gift. And that's a new way for us to try to do it now, even a year and a half in. So. Yeah. I can echo that, uh, Kim and, and Lillian. Uh, this coming Sunday, I am uh, preaching at my church and another church at the same time. Uh, because of technology. <laughs> so I have pre-recorded my sermon for my church, uh, who still meets virtually, um, and the other church that I'm preaching at, they are meeting in person, so I'll be there in person. And that's all because of technology. So it's really been a blessing. I just want to talk about the non-church parts of technology and the ability to have meetings and be able to include more people in them, because we ha have a lot of snowbirds here so they can still be part of the leadership, even though they're in Florida in the winter or Maine in the summer. And so that's been huge as well. You know, it's not just about the worship. It's also about having the meetings and being sure everyone can be included. Yeah, to point. add to that, Robin, I, my congregation has decided the council, they, we are continuing to meet via Zoom because mm -hmm. it's easier that way. Yes. Even even though they want it, we're, we're together for worship. We, we do our meetings via Zoom. And don't you find that just because Zoom is sort of a difficult medium, uh, it does force us to have shorter meetings. <laughs> yes, we stay on track with our agenda. It's awesome. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Jeff, at one point you, you pulled off during COVID, you were able to serve two churches simultaneously as an interim minister. How did you do that? Yeah, exactly. Uh, uh, it was a matter of basically, yeah, doing two sermons at the same time. Uh, one was pre-recorded and one was live, uh, live via Zoom. Uh, and this allowed me to, yeah, to to yeah, to serve in a part-time capacity in in two congregations, and just divide things up so that I would be. Uh, present to one church on Tuesdays and a different church on Wednesdays and kind of organize it that way. So they knew when they, when I was available um, and, and technology really allowed for, yeah, lots of meetings and the logistics of, you know, these churches are an hour apart. So, and, and there's traffic in my area, so it can be even longer and, and, but I didn't have to drive all the all the time, because uh, we could do a lot over over technology, so it made a huge difference. So let me ask this question then, though how how have you found um, how have you found the ability in your various settings to build community when you are part time, or perhaps when you're not geographically in that place? Um, what are some of the the hacks you've you've learned along the way to share with others? 
For me, it was uh, writing my sermons on Saturdays in a coffee shop down the street from the church. I mean, did it get anybody to come to church? No, but it also helped me understand the town. And then when I was in Grand Rapids, I would I was working in coffee shops half the day because I was working remotely anyway. But that really, because I'd never lived there before, gave me a really good sense of what was going on in the, in the city and who were the players and what people talked about. So that was um, a really big plus. And then because I was working remotely, I was also able to work in the church office one day a week. So if people wanted to stop by, I could just chat with them too. So um, so those were the a couple of my super easy hacks that you can do at home. As your, as your former um, preaching professor, though, I just want to clarify that if you were writing your sermon on Saturday, that was for the sermon eight days later, right? Oh, yeah, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Okay. Uh-oh. <laughs> um, I love that example, though, of, of making use of your work time, but also being present physically and being available like that. That's, that's so creative. Um, do others of you have ideas that you've learned along the way? I had mentioned, um, I do use whatever tools I have available to me. And there are certain people in the church that use Facebook a lot. And I know that's not everybody's favorite. Um, but I found in some cases that they respond quicker if I include them in a Facebook group chat than if I send an email. <laughs> um, so getting to know what different people use and using whatever those tools are that are available has been a, a, a big game changer for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's I, I would add that like doing this is slightly a, uh, about, a little different way of talking about building community, but, but to talk about it like uh, one, uh, not so much in the technology area, but, but in, um, kind of how do people rally around some of what we're talking about in part-time ministry and uh if it's a new role that they're used to the pastor doing x y or z and now there's more of a distribution of, of responsibility and roles how do you how do people come around to want to do that and i think this helps build community too because you it, it, one of the things i have found is when when you do have somebody who uh has an appetite for something and wants to spread their wings a little and you give them the encouragement and the permission to do it that one can be transformative for them if you're intuitive enough as a pastoral leader to pick up on that and give them wings and give them permission that makes a ton of difference because they sometimes are waiting for you to give them permission even though you might maybe don't think you need to and the uh and the other part where it becomes a community builder is to give them a platform to talk about what difference it made uh, in their life and in the life of those that they touched through through their ministry. Maybe they gave a sermon for the first time as a lay person. And what what did that mean for them in the whole process of wrestling with scripture, preparing prayerfully, uh, hearing the feedback, thinking about you know how it was going to be received by Paul and Susie and and these other people, you know, or any number of other examples that it could be. I, I'm a big believer in in that as because people say, how do you motivate lay people to get involved in more ministry? Well, let them do the talking. Let the ones who have found it powerful give them space to testify, so to speak, and uh, or to you know tell their story. Um, and it 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 it, go, it goes a lot farther than me kind of uh, nudging and and uh, you know trying to twist arms or something. Yeah. Amen. I mean, so I've I've written a book on testimony about reclaiming the practice of testimony for mainline congregations because I think it's something that in some of our denominations we lost and it's so valuable. Um, there's there's something amazing um, for lay people to hear other lay people talk about their experience of God. I mean, we clergy love Jesus so much that we are willing to accept a salary for it. But, you know, there's something powerful about having lay people speak to each other. I mean, they expect us to talk about that stuff, you know. And I think um, in many of our denominations, we would say we have um, 
a high value on the ministry of the laity or the priesthood of all believers. But if you were to show up in most of our churches and look at our worship service, you would never know that because you would see mostly clergy in robes doing most of the talking and you know other people singing or maybe reading something. So I love the idea of bringing testimony into it. Um, let's go though, also I wanna invite everybody here, if you have any questions for our panelists or our author, please put them in the chat. And I wanna now get into some of the, the challenges and things that you all wish you had known before you, entered into part-time ministry? You know, are there questions you wished you had asked that search committee or things that you wished you had put in that contract agreement? Um, Jamie, I know you have some story on that that you'd like to share. Yeah, I can jump in here. Absolutely. Um, in terms of what I wish I had known about the contract or the covenant agreement, one, I wish I had gone through it with a fine tooth comb, every single line of it. Um, every single line of it, uh, but the particulars, not just the, the salary, the compensation package, but being part-time, what does that mean when you have 52 Sundays in a year? What does it mean when you have fifth Sundays? What are you gonna do, the hours? Um, um, and, the, and not only that, but also um, as Jeff was saying earlier, um, I wish I had had a conversation about not only what my responsibilities would be, but also what the congregation's responsibilities would be. Um, when I look at my contract now, I'm like, oh, the only thing that's reduced on here is the hours. It's a full-time full contract. The only thing reflects that is part-time is the hours and the compensation. Um, but that was my first pastorate, so great lesson learned. Uh, so going forward, I know that those are the things to, to look out for. Um, and, and the big one being, what is the congregation's role in this, in this agreement? For me, going from part-time to full-time, one of the eye-openers, and I kind of knew this from reading Facebook clergy group stuff, but you know, you always think, oh, what won't happen to me? Um, because my full-time, my other jobs were full-time jobs, I had benefits with them. But then when I decided to go full-time ministry, if you're going to be a UCC pastor, you really need to think about um, your insurance. Because if you take a 20 hour or more a week gig, a clock starts. And if you don't um, apply for the UCC insurance within 90 days, it's going to be really hard to get it later. So just the FYI, um, in 2019, I did a speak out about this at the Milwaukee Synod because it's, you know, we talk about um, our economic justice in the UCC and we're really not being that way with our pastors. So just an FYI, if you are part-time, you might want to make it 19 hours if you ever think that you want to take a full-time gig. Others, other advice? I found um, a creative way of managing that. And, and part of it was because of Robin having spoken out at uh, the Milwaukee Synod. When I took on the, the, the role with National, um, it was a part-time role. And so I was very intentional in negotiating what I did with my church when we had a new contract. And I know the church has struggled. We're a small community um, and national was part of my, my benefit package was for them to pay insurance. So I wanted the church to benefit from that, but I didn't wanna lose that insurance when that contract expired because it was only for a year and a half. And so what I did is I made sure that the church set aside monies, even though national was paying for my insurance um, and then I was able to gift them some of that back um, with a, a designated way in a designated way. Um, so I made sure that they were used to paying the pastor's insurance so that when the contract was up, they went back to paying pension boards for the insurance. And I wouldn't have been thinking about that um, had I not been aware of what the UCC's guidelines were and what the expectations were. So I wanted to make sure that my church understood what was expected because I wanted them to feel the responsibility and carry that because whether I'm their pastor or not, I wanted them to be paying the insurance for that in, in that way. That's a I great point. 
and, Je and Jeff, in the book, you have some um, really creative uh, examples where a church might think, oh, we don't have much money. We can't do this. We can't do that. And um, you've got some great examples of how the church can make, um, has more resources toward supporting a pastor than they know if they use them creatively. Yeah, uh, right. There's, so, sometimes there's um, the pastorate or the, or the parsonage rather uh, is, is an asset that a, that a congregation can, can share. Um, there's, there, there, there are ways that the, that the congregation can, um, yeah, kind of, you know, make it possible for the for the pastor to uh, use his or her gifts and also um, to have time to do other work as well. Um, is is one of the one of the gifts is is being openly communicative so that the expectations are are managed well and. Um, so that the pastor and the congregation don't, so that it's not seen like I'm like, like I'm complaining if I point out, you know, that my hours are finite and that that's just part of how we, how we do things, but, uh, and, and yet allow for, you know, one of the things I've learned is, is having, um, a, uh, a little bit of a floater unit that, you know, I'll, it works for me to designate a day or two, depending on how large the contract is to, to working for that congregation, a uh, particular day of the week, but also having then a, a little bit of a floater unit, like two or three hours so that I can respond to email and, or something kind of quickly so that I don't become a, a bottleneck for things that the church is trying to do. Uh, and, and the reason that kind of fills in is it helps the church thrive, but it also gives me time that I don't have to just be answering whatever comes up whenever it comes up. And I can't ever get my uh, traction doing other work, other creative work that's important to me, uh, both you know, vocationally and professionally. And so it's um, all of that is, is our, our gifts that the congregation can can give. Uh, it's, it's like that uh, benefactor of the arts uh, concept that we talked about uh, before. Yeah, that's right. Like um, one of the things that Jeff talks about in his book is that. Um, Sometimes the other job that a pastor has is something creative or in the arts. You might be a visual artist or a writer as Jeff is. And so the congregation can feel like a sense of um, pride in participating in the great tradition of being a patron of the arts. So they might provide the parsonage and the health insurance. And then that allows Jeff as a writer to um, have the opportunity to write about, for example, part-time ministry instead of writing you know, for a PR job or something like that. Um, yeah. But but on the nuts and bolts level, I, mean, I think we all agree that boundaries and keeping units of time is the way to go. But back to real life, you know, the phone rings and it's the funeral home. Um, how do you handle that? You know, we want a service, it's Monday, we want the service on Wednesday. How have you all learned to negotiate that? I think for me, um, I have been lucky or blessed to just have um, a really great congregation and also um, my places of, 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 of other work have been really great and flexible with that. Um, and this is before COVID, I did have a, an incident I was sharing with, with our group earlier. I was um, on my way to my full-time um, position as a, a college counselor, and I received a call um, that one of our church members had passed unexpectedly, um, wasn't sick or anything. And so in that moment, I was like, oh, God, what do I do? Um, and so I chose to call in to my other, I don't recommend this, I called into my full-time job, um, who was very understanding and explained to them what was going on, and they 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 worked with me, and so it it worked out perfectly. And so it's great if you have that relationship. Uh, I'm only able to do um, all of these roles because they're all very flexible, and they all work with me uh, to to make that happen. Yeah, this is the same. Um, 
there was a couple of times there was a lot of pastoral care that went on on my cell phone in the atrium of the building where I worked full time because yes. somebody was dying and it's like, well, you got to walk them through it. Even if you can't be there, you can at least mm -hmm. chat with them in some capacity. Yeah, I think a lot of it has to do with relationships. And even um, when I finished the contract position with National and and looked to other possibilities. I was interviewed to do um, administrative support part-time with the Illinois Conference, which is what I'm doing now. And one of the questions they asked me was just that, what would you do in a situation if you, know, you had somebody with a pastoral need? And you know, I have two particular days of the week where I'm working committed in the office at, at the conference office. Um, and I had to respond, honestly, you know, I would do it by case by case basis. Um, but generally speaking, unless somebody needs you present um, at a loved one's side when they're passing, um, which has not been the case through COVID because it's not been a possibility, um, the rest of it has been very flexible. And, you know, finding a day that works for everyone um, it's been manageable, but my priority is always going to be my church. Um, that's just the way I have it in my head. Um, but I've been able to work around it. So it's case by case, really. Yes, yeah, it's, it's so weird. I used to be a, a chaplain. And so I kind of see myself still in that role, although not formally. And but I remember as a chaplain having to sort of triage and mm -hmm. figure and prioritize where you need to be. And so I, I still find myself doing that. <laughs> yes. Right right now this is what yeah yep this is great and we've had one question that's popped up which i think is a really important one um what are some key learnings jeff for that congregation that is moving toward a part-time ministry for the first time they're making that transition and what um what are the learnings for the congregation but also for the pastor who is in that role it seems like that's a pretty unique and tricky role for that first part-time pastor yeah definitely it's a and it's a situation that many more congregations are in the the, the recent uh, survey out of hartford seminary documents the uh how, how more congregations are uh looking at that transition and so it's it's the ideal way when is well is to is to look ahead and plan to begin thinking about it uh like 18 months ahead uh so that you can uh, really chart out okay we're gonna be we're gonna make this transition and it's going to involve not just uh trimming the hours of one staff person and just saying okay that's it uh, we'll need a little different job description. It's really rethinking the the church and and how the ministries are all going to to happen. To really do some soul searching on uh, what do we need to be for our community and how are we going to do that with less dependence upon a professional clergy person. Uh, that's an important conversation, and it's great to have it in advance if the church has enough foresight to. And, and an opportunity to do that. Uh, sometimes though, there isn't, uh, it just doesn't work that way. It happens more suddenly. And all of a sudden the treasurer says, uh, you know, a month before uh, the new budget comes out, we, we can't afford a full-time pastor anymore. So um, we need to just do what we can do. So all of a sudden it happens. And, and for those it's, but it's not too late to do it in a way that still thrives. It's, it's. Um, I would say for for those who are making this transition, it's very important, like you say, uh, Lillian, that the pastor, uh, the pastor has to want to go part time. Um, if the pastor is being forced, so to speak, to take a part time salary and is and is not happy about that uh, and doesn't have a a plan that they're happy about to to make it work, um, it's probably not going to go well. Uh, it's so a lot of times this happens when there when there is a transition of leadership, and so one pastor leaves, and then that's a good time to think about this so that 
the next pastor that you bring in is somebody who genuinely wants to do part-time ministry. And there are, there are many of us who do it by choice because we have other work that we're passionate about and, uh, or we have things, we have a, a family role that we do, you know, there's, uh, uh in addition, and, and we don't want to be full-time, um, in addition to raising children at home or taking care of, uh, uh, loved ones who need, uh, aging parents or, or, or whatnot. So anyway, um, those are a couple of factors that can make a difference. Does that answer the question? Yes, that's very helpful. Um, I think a lot of times too, you will see a church transition from full-time to um, part-time, maybe at the retirement of a long-term pastor, and they've been kind of trying to make it work financially, but they're really in the hole. And so I think that's a particular challenge because A, you're suddenly part-time, but B, you're following a long-term beloved pastor, which is always very challenging. So um, another thing I've seen happen is sometimes churches will say, well, let's let's yoke or partner with another church that's also um, in this transition mode. Uh, to my mind, that looks like four times as much work. Uh, but what is, what's your read on that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, for my part, uh, the the uh, it 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 does need to be really pretty clearly laid out. Sometimes the two churches will coordinate together and basically say, you know, we're sharing a staff person. How are we going to do that? But uh, but the polity in the UCC is so uh, locally centered that um, a lot of times the the two churches won't even talk to each other. They'll just happen to be contracting with the same person, just like two, you know, neighbors use the same plumber, you know, like they don't necessarily talk to each other about that. They just do it. Um, and that's really, I see a lot of that. I mean, literally I have a colleague who the two churches, Lutheran and UCC are literally um, next to each other, like geographically. And she does one Lutheran service and then runs around the corner and does a UCC service. Um, and, you know, that's, she's part of her work is to say, you know, should we be sharing a secretary, for example? Do we both need to have the office open? Um, those are those are the tough, tough calls that uh, get made. But um, I wanna end on a note of encouragement. Uh, what are some of the blessings of being part-time in ministry? What's a blessing that you would like somebody to know who hasn't experienced this life? Like something that uh, would make you commend it to others? I, I would say for me, I think the, the blessing in all of this in part-time work is just the flexibility to be able to do pursue other passions, things that I'm very interested in. Um, that's a huge blessing. And then also, also the level of liberation that I experience um, with having other f streams of income uh, and not just one, <laughs> not just one resource is, uh, I experience that as very liberating. I would agree with Jamie. It, the flexibility for me is huge. I am not the kind of person who likes to be um, boxed in. So I don't like to be stuck in an office. I, I mean, I like to be out there and, and doing things. Um, so the, the flexibility for me is critical. Um, the other thing is that, I, and I wanna mention this as we close because I think it's touched on, having the expectations lined out um, with leaders in the church, um, especially if you're even considering doing a yoked thing. I see somebody in the chat. That's why I wanted to address that. Um, having those expectations communicated and lined out um, is what makes all of this possible. Um, and and I, I find a tremendous amount of joy being able to experience things outside of the church. Um, I found when I'm within one church, if I'm, my whole world is around that church, I lose that connection with the wider community and the wider church. And I think um, for me, I need the perspective. So working for National and even now working with the conference, it helps me balance my perspective. So I can, don't get lost or mired in the weeds, if you will, of, of a local church setting. So I, that's how I experience the joy. 
No. For me, it was um, because the, the times I was part-time, I also had full-time jobs. So I was always bivocational. And when church was great in my nerves, usually my other job was going well or vice versa. So it kept me a little balanced, but it also kept me grounded so that I wasn't just living in church land and getting caught up in all the language. And because when you're working with folks who don't care about church, you have to remember that you have to speak a different language. And so it was really helpful to, especially now that I'm full time, you know, I still like, you know, you have to be able to talk to people where they are and not just in all this fluffy acronym land. So that's been helpful too. <laughs> Alphabet soup. Every, yeah. every pastor should be forced to spend time with people who don't give a hoot about the church. Amen. You know, we yeah. forget. Yeah. What? Absolutely. Yeah. Jeff, uh, let's let yeah. you have the last word on on the blessings that you see in this in this new era. Uh, thank you, Lillian. Yes, uh, I concur with all that the other three have said on this. Uh, I've had all those blessings myself, and um, and seen it in my churches. And um, I mean, I I feel like this is is just um, a a place where there's there's just a, an an opportunity one. Part of, part of it is you can, there's a benefit to being able to, to, to stop, right? Uh, when you're full-time, sometimes the parishioners feel like um, they can keep asking. And, um, and there is a, a different sort of sensibility uh, around that. And, and so there's kind of a built-in boundary that, uh, that everybody sort of understands um, in part-time ministry, and I, it's it's kind of counterintuitive, but but part-time ministers, um, in some ways, enjoy a different type of respect, um, and and that's kind of a hidden blessing that uh, I know some of my full-time colleagues and peers don't always feel like their congregants respect them and what they do or honor the boundaries. Um, the boundaries are more sort of inherently. Um, uh, recognized uh, in this because everybody knows it's you, you've got to work with it um, as long as the pastor uh, make, makes people aware um, and, and the and the lay leaders too. Um, but that's that's kind of a, a smaller point on the the, the 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 bigger part is just the um, the joy of doing this kind of work is uh, it, it's just so it's such a blessing to see the lay people get the opportunity and be and 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 to have to be encouraged and and discover a lot of times clergy keep all the best ministry stuff for themselves right um preaching is really fun uh, delivering the sacraments to someone at their bedside is very meaningful um baptizing a child is is incredible like these are these are these are all largely done by the ordained people how can the ordained people get all the uh at all the things uh, that are so wonderful um there's um and and of course you, you know the sacraments are we, we administer them the same in the in the part-time churches uh as in the full-time but you can utilize more of the muscles that we're given in the ucc uh or or in other denominations that may be represented here to do it um so lay people can do a lot more in the church than they sometimes realize um, and now they're finally living into it. And it's just an incredible joy to see people be Eucharistic ministers, uh, to be, um, you know, uh, out there d doing that kind of ministry. So, so I just get a lot of vicarious joy from, from seeing them um, flourish in ways that uh, have, have been a long time coming. I think you all are, are wonderful examples and role models of pastors who uh, truly see yourself as equipping and encouraging people in their discipleship. I think it takes a strong ego to do that and a strong spiritual core. Um, and uh, thank you to the panelists and thank you, Jeff. Uh, to those of you who haven't read the book yet, I commend it. We just hit the tip of the iceberg and I like that there's so many real lives from different settings and denominations in there that will be um, just a great tool to read with board members and each other or in seminary. So thank you so much. And I'll turn it back to uh, Lisa and say, thank you so much, Lisa, for allowing me to bring this topic that I'm passionate about to this CTS community. 
Absolutely. Thank you, Lillian. Thank you, Jeff. And thank you to our panelists, Robin, Jamie, and Kim. It was a delight to welcome all of you here today um, and to take part in this really important and fascinating conversation. And um, yeah, blessings to all of you. Um, we are right up against our time. I have three quick announcements, so I'll go really fast. Um, First of all, students, um, uh, just a, an announcement that the Regenstein Library at U of C um, is going to be reopening again to CTS students. So Yasmin will be sending out an email with details about how you can access the library, but good news there um, for all your study needs. And speaking of study needs, uh, every week we give a Starbucks gift card to one of our students, recognizing that caffeine is an essential part of your seminary journey. Um, and this week's uh, winner of the Starbucks gift card is Becca Blackburn. So Becca, watch your email for um, something to go get a tasty beverage and energize yourself. Um, and the last thing I just wanna share is I would encourage you all to join us every Wednesday at noon central on this link. The link stays the same every week. Um, so the, the link that got you here today will bring you here next week. We would love to see you back again with us. Um, next week, we have a real treat. We're gonna be led um, by our PhD students and Jamie Fluker, and they're going to be sharing with us, speaking about um, speaking about the topic of colonialism and theological education. Um, so come and and get your brain cells working and um, and engage with us. And uh, I I wish you all the best. It is a joy to see you here every week. Um, may the week ahead bring you blessings. And thank you again to our speakers and guests. Bye everyone. Bye, everybody.